630 AD, the political religion of Islam begins its cancerous spread across the Middle East. Within 100 years, the Muslims' bloody conquest and subjugation of others through invasion and war reaches the very heart of France. Beaten back at the Battle of Tours, the cancer would resurge once more as the Ottoman Empire. With the First World War, dreams of world domination are lost again as Islam's empire is crushed and the Muslim world stagnates in a medieval state. Even though multiple countries are carved from the Ottoman Empire and given into the hands of Muslim rulers, hatred for the West seethes. The Middle East becomes a petri dish of ancient hatred for Jews and the reconstituted Jewish state. In the late 1960s, the Soviet Union finds an ally and thus begins an exploitation that reverberates to this day in one of the greatest campaigns of disinformation, an insidious formula to undermine and destroy Western civilization, a strategy still at work today. Prepare yourself for an eye-opening revelation as we unravel the world of disinformation. Disinformation is a kernel of truth around which you weave a tissue of falsehoods. And that twist with a lie is disinformation. People have manipulated. The media is manipulated and manipulating. This informer has no respect for me. Disinformation has a very long-term strategic objective. An influence campaign to influence American attitudes, to influence public opinion. Disinformation appears to come from a trusted source. A lie by the government. Disinformation flows from the delusion that you can change the world. Very sinister. This information has been uh, going on for years and years. If you can get the New York Times to release your misinformation, it becomes disinformation. It's deceptive, it's disgusting, it's despicable, and it's part of their political program. It's part of an overall strategy. I've received disinformation as a way to sidestep us, particularly in the intelligence world. Disinformation has been part of the art of war going back to ancient times. Disinformation is pervasive. It's pervasive in our society and in our culture. It's a form of psychological warfare. In 1972, Lieutenant General Yon Mihai Pacepa was named the Deputy Chief of the Foreign Intelligence Service for Romania. Within a short time, he had absolute power over all the top organizations dealing with the West. As I was now in the inner sanctum of the Soviet bloc intelligence community, I was sent to Moscow to meet with Yuri Andropov, the chairman of the Soviet KGB. He told me about the next step in his Middle East disinformation strategy. Yuri Andropov had begun his unprecedented 15 years as KGB chairman just a few months before the 1967 Six-Day War. Israel soundly defeated the Soviet Union's most important allies in the Arab world, Egypt and Syria. In those days, both were in effect being run by Soviet advisors. As the new KGB chairman, Andropov decided to repair the Kremlin's prestige by humiliating Israel. His master plan was to revive anti-Semitism to regenerate international terrorism against the United States and Israel. Hundreds of undercover agents infiltrated the Islamic target countries, and by 1978, the Soviet bloc intelligence community had sent some 4,000 such agents. The KGB planted the seed by distributing an Arabic translation of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, along with documentary material proving that the United States was a Zionist country whose aim was to start a new crusade on the Islamic world. Thousands of copies were disseminated throughout the Middle East. This was certainly one of the greatest disinformation campaigns of modern times. Kids in many Middle Eastern countries, Arab countries, uh, read the protocols. The textbooks have references to the protocols as if this is the real, reliable documents. America is the great Satan, and Israel is the little Satan. That's what every leftist believes, and that's what every Islamist believes. And that would be what the KGB believed. Uh, so 
you know, get the Jews. The terrorist war came into action at the end of 1968, when the KGB transformed airplane hijacking into an instrument of terror. Before 1969 came to an end, Palestinian terrorists, trained by the KGB, had hijacked their first LL plane and landed it in Algeria. The hijacking had been planned and coordinated by the KGB, but to conceal his hand and drop off had the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, a KGB front group, take credit for the hijacking. During the next two years, various KGB-trained Palestinian terrorists took credit for hijacking 13 Israeli and Western planes all these hijackings were masterminded by the KGB. The Soviet Union was very involved with Arab nationalists, uh, basically from you know the World War II period on, if not before. In the latter part of its lifespan, uh, the Soviet Union began developing, and I think very aggressively engaged in supporting people who weren't so much Arab nationalists as they were Islamists or jihadists, uh, but in some degree were the, the sort of follow-on, the successors to the Arab nationalists. They trained terrorists. Uh, they helped them become much more formidable in terms of uh, threat. And to varying degrees, they enabled or certainly facilitated their uh, association with and uh, interoperations in some cases with terrorists that the Soviets were also involved with in other parts of the world. The political success of hijacking Israeli airplanes prompted the KGB to expand into organizing public executions and attacks on Jews in airports, train stations, and other public places. The KGB threw millions of dollars and thousands of people into Andropov's disinformation and terror war. Here's, here's the thing. The, the Islamists have been to school, and particularly the Palestinians, uh, with the KGB and the communists um, during the Cold War. What the uh, Islamists, the Muslim Brotherhood in particular, didn't learn from the KGB. They've learned from the American and European left. Andropov preached to me that in today's world, when nuclear arms have made military force obsolete, terrorism should become our main weapon against American Zionism. He looked at the Muslim world as a waiting petri dish in which we could nurture a strain of hate America, grown from the bacterium of Marxist-Leninist thought. Their illiterate, oppressed mobs could easily be whipped up to a fever pitch. We had only to keep repeating over and over that the United States was a war-mongering Zionist country, anxious to take over the world. Anti-American, anti-Zion, uh, they're opposite Zionism, they're opposite sides of the same coin. And if it's easier to excite someone with anti-Zionism, knowing that it will also produce anti-Americanism, that is a, a classic uh, invitation to disinformation specialists. If you read Khomeini's biography carefully, you'll see that he was trained both by Nazis and by Soviet communists on how to organize his movement. So the whole structure of the cadres inside the Khomeini movement came straight from Moscow. Well, I've seen intel reports uh, over the years that, uh, that the Russians were working with uh, the Palestinian uh, terrorist organizations, not just Hamas, but the PLO and others. And the PLO trained in the Soviet Union. It's the least secret fact in the modern world. And the alliance between radical Muslims and the world communist organizations is very intimate and has been there all along. Nothing new. And why not? They have, they have a common view of the kind of society and government they want to have, totalitarian, and they have a common enemy, us. What's quite striking as we flash forward to today is the ways in which one of their clients, the Muslim Brotherhood, has emulated and frankly improved upon is targeting all of the civil society institutions in this country and our government for the purposes of subverting us and ultimately achieving their, their victory. 
if you look at the Palestinians uh, in Gaza and the West Bank, um, their heroes are Nazis. Their heroes are people who kill people because they're Jews, not because of anything they did, just because they're Jews. Their children are taught to hate Jews and want to kill them. The cumulative effect of distributing millions of Arabic translations of the protocols in Arabic over 20 plus years throughout the Islamic world may be self-evident. July 22nd, 1978, a date I will never forget. I was ordered to organize the killing of Noel Bernard, the director of Radio Free Europe's Romanian program. I knew then I had to, to ultimately decide, would I be a defector or a murderer? Disinformation means lying, and lying is the first step towards stealing and killing. I might have done a lot of reprehensible things during all those years, but I had resolved never to be involved in political assassinations. The prospect pushed me over the edge. My father's heed that I must be strong to be different rang in my ears, and I suddenly became strong enough to break from the darkness. On Sunday, July 23rd, 1978, I flew to Bonn, where I had to deliver a message from Ceausescu to the West German Chancellor. It was my final assignment for the megalomaniac so I became a defector, a word that was too close to traitor and felt like a chain around my neck. My defection became a whirlwind trip in a CIA plane sent from Washington. It was past midnight when I secretly flew out of Germany. Throughout all those years of torment in Romania, I had been certain that I would not die under communism, no matter how high I might have been shoved up the communist ladder. At Andros Air Force Base, I was greeted as a free man. The joy of finally becoming part of this land of liberty, where nothing was impossible, well, that was surpassed only by the joy of simply being alive. Alone in my room that night, I fell to my knees and prayed out loud for the first time in more than 25 years. It took me a while. It was hard for me to find the right words to express my great joy and thanks to the good Lord. Forgiveness for my past life, strength for my new life, that's all I asked for. General Ion Mihai Pacepa defected in July, and that changed everything. Uh, he's the senior defector from the Cold War, two-star general, advisor to President Dictator for Life Nikolai Ceausescu. I was involved in debriefing the general for years. Uh, when a person defects, you ask what they know, what knowledgeability they have, microwave transmissions, scientific, technical, whatever, and he said, in five years, I'll begin to forget things you haven't yet asked me, and he was right. So he knew it all. Uh, the first time I heard the name of Ion Mihai Pacepa was in 1978, listening to Radio Free Europe. It was in the summer of 1978, and they announced that the head of the Romanian Foreign Intelligence, advisor to President Nicolae Ceausescu, General Ion Mihai Pacepa, defected to the West. I called a friend of mine, and I said, let's get together. I said, have you ever heard of this Pacepa fellow and son? So I said, oh. Nobody talks about him. He was a very, very big shot. General Pacepa had, as we know, a, a crisis of conscience, a change of heart. And he eventually came away from the dark side and came to the US and helped the CIA to figure out the communist world. Listen, I have to say that Pacepa uh, is one of a handful of people in my life who has given me a fundamentally different and accurate understanding of the way the world works. He's illuminated the history of the modern world to me. Before he defected to the U.S., he never had contact 
my understanding with U.S. intelligence, not with me, not with the CIA, when he decided to jump, it was everything or nothing. That's important. Before he defected, he had a trip that he arranged to all the Eastern European intelligence chiefs just to talk about how you're doing, what kind of things you have. He would tell what he had, they would tell Hungarian, the Czech, the Polish. So when he came out, he was that much more valuable because he knew those countries' information as well. I mean, that's a big deal. So how far in advance did he plan it? Well, like, oh, this, I just thought of it overnight. No, that's a months in advance trip. I have uh, publicly supported the idea that what General Pacepa did in 1978 was a service to the Romanian people. He didn't betray Romania or the Romanian nation. He betrayed a despicable terrorist dictatorship. And I think that by in, in so doing, he helped uh, the survival of the idea of honor in the history of Romania. Soon after Pacepa's defection, Ceausescu imposed two death sentences and decreed a bounty of two million US dollars for Pacepa's death. Terrorist leaders Arafat and Gaddafi set one more million dollars reward each. The first major attempt to kill me in the US was codenamed Operation 363, and it used Carlos the Jackal as the would-be assassin. Thanks to the CIA, Carlos was unable to find me. Although Pacepa had been granted asylum, much of the information he gave the Carter administration was dismissed. The disinformation campaign that he'd helped launch to create a westernized image of Ceausescu had worked. Jimmy Carter had determined that he could end the Cold War by welcoming Ceausescu as a new type of communist, a democratic communist. The State Department and administration helping Romania to maintain its most favored nation trade status did not want to hear or believe what I disclosed. In my eagerness to blurt out what I knew about the inner workings of the Soviet bloc's disinformation machinery, I immediately reported that Ceausescu's glorious image in Washington had been handcrafted by the KGB. That was not good news for President Carter, who had just three months earlier had publicly hailed Ceausescu as a great national and international leader. Thus, Carter alleged that my defection had been concocted by the KGB to destroy his excellent relations with Ceausescu. Ceausescu was unaware of Carter's distrust and dismantled much of the Warsaw Pact's spy service in the West. It was not until the election of Ronald Reagan that Pacepa was able to impart his valuable information to the West. I came here right before Reagan. I remember being interviewed in the beginning. People said, oh, you're from the former Soviet Union. You were a dissident. What do you think? Who's going to win? And I said, that's obvious to me, Ronald Reagan. And this is before it became clear that he has a good chance. They said, really? Why? I said, finally, we have a president who gets it, who understands what the real evil is. The Soviet Union is not joking. They, they work 24-7 to destroy the world, to take over the world. They're not joking. They mean it. I meant it. Millions of people are willing to die to destroy America. With God's help, we can and will resolve the problems which now confront us. And after all, why shouldn't we believe that? We are Americans. God bless you and thank you. Thank you very much. So is that every time you wrote an LHM that came from Pachepa, it was going right to Reagan. So the headquarters and the West Wing of the White House through his national security advisor and to the president. Well, it made me write them really as carefully as I could to make sure we had it all straight, especially because we were debriefing in Romanian. But that's the intensity and the level of, of consequence. Let us be aware that while they preach the supremacy of the state, declare its omnipotence over individual man, and predict its eventual domination of all peoples on the earth, they are the focus of evil in the modern world. In 1987, Pacepa's book, Red Horizons, allowed the world to see Ceausescu naked, the way he really was, an assassin and an international terrorist. His life of outrageous luxury was paid for with money obtained from the illegal sale of human beings, arms, and drugs. Ceausescu was probably one of the most evil. It was darker in Romania, both kilowatt and evil-wise, than it was even in, even in Moscow. Ceausescu was a very evil man and his wife, uh, uh, Elena. But when P Pacepa asked me, I'd, I read his book. And later, I took Pacepa's book down to the White House and gave it to the president. And that helped change 
uh, the issue of most favored nation trading status. He would later call it, my Bible for dealing with dictators. Ceausescu had cleverly devised a system he named the Horizons to dupe the West into believing that he was a different sort of communist and that Romania, therefore, was a different sort of communist country. The big lie, Romania was independent of Moscow, more interested in trade with the West and less repressive than other Soviet bloc countries. In 1988, Red Horizons was serialized on Radio Free Europe and heard in Romania for the first time. Pacepa's book revealed the damnable corruption of the Marxist government of Romania in great detail. And I remember being in Romanian homes where they'd close the curtains and they'd get on the ground and turn on that radio frequency and make, they made sure even their kids weren't home because kids informed on parents. And when Pacepa's book came out and uh, Pachapa's revelations, it was like it gave power to the powerless. I can't even explain. Romanians were, um, I've never seen such, it was like finally someone that people will listen to has made known of our suffering and our oppression and our plight. I knew instinctively this was going to be the beginning of this, the end of this regime. It was like, a, you know, a drop of water to uh, an army that was just sleeping. I have always said that Red Horizons is the single greatest portrait of a communist society that I've ever read. A lot of this was what Romanians and a lot of other people learned through Mike Pacepa's book, Red Horizons, uh, because the corruption, the uh, incredible uh, self-dealing uh, uh, brutality and all the rest uh, of um, uh, the Romanian uh, communist establishment, uh, Ceausescu and the others, both Ceausescus, uh, was uh, stunning. And the image of, the Ce of Ceausescu and his uh, crowd in the uh, clique in, in the book was basically one of a thug, of a uh, basically a group of gangsters who took over Romania and were fundamentally the second thing, were basically, in spite of their pretense to have an independent foreign policy very different from the Soviet Union, in reality being Soviet tools. That shattered the whole edifice, the whole um, world of pretense, including the immense amount of disinformation that Ceausescu and his crowd were producing and disseminating in the West. Across Europe this wall will fall, for it cannot withstand faith, it cannot withstand truth. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. On November 9th, 1989, as, as I sat in front of my television watching the Berlin Wall being torn down, and my eyes welled up with tears, I was incredibly proud to be a citizen of the United States. The whole world was expressing its gratitude to this great country for its 45 years of successfully winning the Cold War against the Soviet Empire. As mysteriously as it had begun, the Cold War came to an end. Ronald Reagan had refused to continue the policy of containment and determined to put an end to the evil empire. The fall of the Berlin Wall set in turn a series of events that led to the implosion of the USSR. But had the nightmare of communism really ended? The horrible irony about it is, is that these are the gulags that, that were still, they were created and are still functioning from 1937. I mean, it's just imagine um, Auschwitz, a slightly refurbished and modernized, is still being used to, uh, for European prisoners. And we don't think in those terms, but we should. It's, it's, the, same, it's the same tradition, it's the same formula. I witnessed how Hitler's Third Reich had been demolished, its war criminals put on trial, its military and police forces disbanded, and the Nazis removed from public office. None of these things has happened in the former Soviet Union. No individual has been put on trial. Although the regime killed millions of people, most Soviet institutions have been left in place, and we seem to forget that Russia still has over 6,000 nuclear missiles. When the Cold War ended, there were actually Russians that uh, said to us, um, don't believe that we're going away. 
there were a number of Russians who made that statement to us. We're not going away. We're changing our strategy. So how do you change your strategy? Well, you know, you go underground. You change the name of your organization. It, you change the name of the KGB. Well, the KGB by any other name is still the KGB. It is still the, it is still the most influential entity in, in Russia today, more powerful actually than the Politburo. And it is powerful because the man that is in charge of Russia is a former member of the KGB and considers himself to still be in charge of the KGB. They never lost their focus on destroying America. But I think that they saw that there was a new strategy to be used that would allow us to destroy ourselves. Wow. I think we're doing that, aren't we? In December 1989, anti-government demonstrations began throughout Romania and a revolt spread across the country. On December 25th, Ceausescu and his wife were executed by firing squad, bringing to an end one of the last communist regimes in Europe. Gosh. A Romanian newspaper concluded, the publication of Red Horizons played an uncontested role in revealing in all its hideousness the true face of a dictatorship, which with diabolical cunningness had managed to outfox a part of the world. After the implosion of the USSR, most top US political leaders considered the Soviet Union and its KGB to be ancient history. My last election, please. Yeah. Uh, After my election, I have more thoughts about it. Yeah, I understand. I transmit this information to Vladimir and myself. Soviet intelligence, in terms of its people, in terms of its apparatuses, in terms of its modus operandi, I think is very much alive and well today. And uh, by some accounts, operating, for example, in this country at a level that actually exceeds that of the Cold War. Many in America have bought into another Kremlin disinformation. The Cold War may be over. But unlike other wars, the defeated enemy didn't lay down its weapons. The KGB merely changed its name to the FSB, and Vladimir Putin, a KGB spy chief, enthroned himself in the Kremlin as supreme leader. Thus, he transformed Russia into the first intelligence dictatorship in history. Putin is pretty straightforward. Uh, he has uh, stated that he's going to reform the military, he's going to boost the military, and that, our, our, uh, that the United States is the, basically the enemy. The fact that we dismiss that or try to uh, low-key it low, uh, and, and downplay it uh, is actually a disservice to us. And I, I, I think it's all part of the whole political reset uh, approach that uh, we, we want to take with, uh, with the Russians. And there's a lot of political reasons for doing that, for, uh, such as the Middle East. In August 1999, only days after Putin's appointment, the KGB's framing machinery went back to work. When Putin was in Germany, they liked to say that he was uh, like Peter the Great. He saw the Europe, he saw the rest of the world. He was in East Germany uh, doing a scam in East Germany. He didn't see the rest of the world. He didn't see London and the US and places you need to see to learn, become worldwide and understand it. They're very, very contained in that. But it, my view is it hasn't, hasn't changed. But the concept of disinformation I'll give an example or so that it's much bigger than what we would think. Not just because General Pacepa has said how many hundreds, thousands of people are involved. More people than are in the FBI, for instance, are involved in every aspect with this information over there. I think the instinctive reaction from uh, uh, Putin is to oppose whatever it is that the Western democracies are supporting. He sees us, I think, as essentially an enemy. Uh, and uh, because the example we set, and it's not just us, it's other countries too, the example that we set uh, undermines his ability to order everybody around. We have to remember that Russia lost its international influence with the collapse of the Soviet Union, so, and Putin is a kind of mock dictator, small dictator. As a KGB man, Vladimir Putin cannot think any differently. He thinks the same way as Stalin did. He wants that power, and he can have it with 
that link that he can provide towards it with Ahmadinejad or North Korea. President Vladimir Putin, an ex-lieutenant colonel in the KGB, he once said that the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century was the collapse of the Soviet Union. If you translate this, then the greatest probably bureaucratic catastrophe of the 20th century for Putin was the collapse of the KGB. Soon after President Putin and his ex-KGB officers began running Russia, they moved their country back into the encampment of the Soviet Union's traditional clients, which had been the deadliest enemies of the United States. Putin started out favoring precisely the three governments labeled by the U.S. as an axis of evil, Iran, Iraq, and North Korea. There's no change in disinformation. With what they had as the KGB, now the FSB, don't think that because the wall came down and because Gorbachev is, is gone and maybe working in San Francisco in some sort of a think tank, don't think that that has changed. For all practical purposes, the FSB uh, behaves and undertakes the same uh, types of efforts. 20 years later, after the USSR collapsed, we're back and with a vengeance because KGB is now at the helm of power. So the Soviet Union is now run pretty much single-handedly by uh, a son of the KGB, a man who has never been anything but uh, a, a, a creature of the, uh, the KGB. Um, they can change the name, uh, but it remains a very powerful force in, uh, in, in Russia today, which is deeply regrettable, mostly for the, the people of Russia. Their, their opportunity for uh, uh, real uh, democracy is, has been significantly eroded and, and I think uh, unless something intervenes it's a matter of time before it's gone completely. With deadly secrecy, the Kremlin began arming the anti-American Arab terrorists just as they had done in Andropov's day. On July 12, 2006, militants of Hezbollah armed by Putin's Russia, launched a powerful rocket attack against Israel. Most of the Hezbollah weapons cases captured by the Israeli military forces during that offensive were marked customer, Ministry of Defense of Syria, supplier, KBP, Tula, Russia. Hezbollah has also been recently armed with the Russian-designed FAR-5 rockets, Zelzal-1 rockets, Scud missiles, as well as Russian anti-tank missiles. Putin also quietly reinstituted sales of weapons to Iran and engaged Russia in the construction of a 1,000 megawatt nuclear reactor at Boucher. The uranium conversion facility is capable of producing fissile material for nuclear weapons. Hundreds of Russian technicians also started helping the government of Iran to develop the Shahab missile system, which can carry a nuclear or germ warhead to anywhere in the Middle East and Europe. The big dog in the Persian Gulf region right now because they are developing a nuclear weapon is Iran, so if they could establish that kind of influence and the Iranians would essentially dominate the Persian Gulf region, the Russians corner the market on gas and oil. Russia, Russia sees uh, uh, helping Iran and working with Iran, and it did with Syria as well, uh, uh, as a, a, a very good way uh, to uh, undermine American influence in the Middle East. Uh, clearly, uh, Iran is one of Mr. Putin's greatest allies. They're a great trading partner with him. He's building, has built their nuclear power plants and probably has supplied them with a lot of other technology. We have to look realistically at the potential of a nuclear-armed Iran as being a huge threat, not only to America, but to global stability. Iran's current president, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, had already announced that nothing could stop his country from building nuclear weapons, and he stated that Israel was a disgraceful stain on the Islamic world that would be eliminated. During World War II, thousands of Americans died to eradicate Nazism and its anti-Semitic terrorism. Now we're facing Islamofascism and nuclear anti-Semitic terrorism. In 2006, a former KGB officer, Alexander Ledvininko, defected to Great Britain and revealed some earth-shattering secrets to the British Foreign Intelligence Service. One of those secrets which became public was that the current leader of Al-Qaeda was trained in 1997 by the KGB in Dagestan. Evidence has also begun to reveal that the Kremlin was involved in igniting and then stealing the 2011 Islamic revolutions called the Arab Spring. In Egypt, the most pro-American Islamic country, anti-government demonstrations started on January 25, 2011. 
Some of the young people there who were allegedly demanding democracy could be seen burning the flag of the very country that symbolizes democracy for most of the world. So everything is really unpredictable today in the Middle East, Muslim Brotherhood in Cairo. Um, you can see quite a lot of disinformation going on about them in the American press, that they're not as bad as we thought they were, etc. It's ridiculous, and I can't think of a bigger danger for the Middle East than the rise of the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, these are people who hate us and want Sharia law to be applied everywhere. And what they've done in the two or three towns that they would occupied in Mali is cut hands off to punish people. Makra. Russia's intelligence dictatorship is a brand new political phenomenon, and America needs a brand new foreign policy to deal with it. Otherwise, we're looking at an all new Cold War, one that threatens to be not only cold, but also bloody. The Russians, uh, notwithstanding the end of the Cold War, still are heavily targeting military technology. The problem today is that the intelligence community is not looking at that in that direction any longer. It's really uh, behind most of the problems that we've confronted in this uh, so-called post-Cold War world. I believe Congress should re-examine President Truman's top secret policy paper, NSC 681950. It shaped U.S. foreign policy in the Cold War for 20 years, and it did not blame movies or books for terrorist attacks against the U.S. NSC 68-1950 stated, the issues that face us are momentous, involving the destruction not only of this republic, but of civilization itself. The policy focused on creating a world centered on American liberal capitalist values, and it contained a two-pronged political strategy. One, a superior military power, and two, a campaign of truth, defined as a struggle, above all else, for the minds of men. Truman argued that the propaganda used by the forces of communism could be overcome only by the plain, simple, unvarnished truth. The missiles that destroyed communism were launched from Radio Free Europe, and this was Washington's most important investment during the Cold War. I don't know whether Americans realize this now, over two decades after the fall of the Soviet Empire, but on the other side, we understood it perfectly well. Four thirty p.m. in Moscow, September 11, 2001. Members of the FSB raised their glasses in annual celebration to the birthday of their founder, Felix Dzerzhinsky. During the revolution of 1917, he established and developed the Soviet state security forces that became notorious for torture and mass summary executions. Dzerzhinsky was named Bloody Felix. In 15 minutes, the agents will have something more to celebrate. These extremists say there can be no compromise or dialogue with those they call infidels. It is foolish to think that you can negotiate with them. On September 11th, President George W. Bush called for a war on terror. It was a war, he said, that was rooted in ideology, an ideology that followed in the path of fascism, communism, and totalitarianism. The weapon of choice for that horrific act of terrorism that has changed the face of our world a hijacked airplane, a concept invented by the KGB. This is Yuri Andropov's legacy, the father of a new disinformation era, the father of the age of terrorism. Andropov's anti-American and anti-Jewish terrorism has grown into a kind of a nefarious science threatening the whole civilized world. In the Islamic world, thousands of people danced in the streets for days to celebrate the glorious victory over the American evil. In America, for the first time since the early years of the Vietnam War, the country was united. Democrats and Republicans came together to stop terrorists and terrorist regimes in Iraq and Afghanistan. But when the presidential election rolled around in 2004, many Democrats developed amnesia. In the next century, the community of nations may see more and more of the very kind of threat Iraq poses now, a rogue state with weapons of mass destruction. People have forgotten that for seven and a half years, we found weapons of mass destruction. Since the inspectors left, intelligence reports show that Saddam Hussein has worked to rebuild his chemical and biological weapons stock. Saddam Hussein certainly has chemical and biological weapons. There's no question about that. Even though I approved of Afghanistan and opposed Iraq. 
John Kerry. He said that the Iraq war was the wrong war at the wrong time in the wrong place when he was running for president. What kind of message did that send to a 19-year-old in Fallujah who's facing terrorists when a man who's within a, a hair of being president says, You're, you shouldn't be there? I'm John Kerry, and I'm reporting for duty. During the 2004 Democratic National Convention, one after the other, the convention participants denigrated America's armed forces by portraying their commander-in-chief as a renegade, a liar, a deceiver, and a fraud. The U.S. had over 140,000 soldiers engaged in a grueling war who needed support from all sides. But all they got from that Democratic convention was insults and hatred. The object of war is to break an enemy's will and destroy his capacity to fight. A nation divided in wartime is a nation that invites its own defeat. The Democrats' public attack, insinuating that the president had deceived the American people, was unimaginable disinformation. It was a replay of exactly what Andropov's Ares campaign preached during the Vietnam era. By 2007, most leaders of the Democratic Party were engaged in a frantic campaign to condemn the U.S. for its war in Iraq and to withdraw troops unconditionally. Senator Harry Reid, the Democratic majority leader, famously declared, the war is lost. Today, many liberals and Democrats still believe that George Bush and America are responsible for the war that radical Islam has launched against us. In October of 2011, the Obama administration officially banned the truth. Bowing to pressure from the Hamas-linked CARE and other Islamic advocacy groups, Deputy U.S. Attorney General James Cole directed all components of the Department of Justice to remove all references to Islam in connection with any examination of Islamic Jihad terror activity, thus placing off-limits any investigation of the beliefs, motives, and goals of Jihad terrorists. The, uh, Obama's Middle Eastern policy is that it's America's fault and most of the things that have gone wrong in the world are our fault, and so we have to undo that. So that's why the Cairo speech, that's why the Great Apology Tour, right? Same business with Russia, reset the relationship with Russia, as they put it, because after all, we have, you know, we're, we're responsible for a lot of the bad relations between the United States and Russia. So, so he's been out there basically encouraging the most extreme form of anti-Americanism because he sympathizes with it, because he thinks they're legitimate. So he's been totally unable to recognize the consequences. You I mean, know, whatever you think of him, he doesn't get it. If we don't recognize the enemy, then how can we defeat him? We have now turned a corner in our history for which there is no precedent, and our divisions over the war are deep and troubling. We still don't recognize this war. Reminds me of the situation with the Soviet Union. It took us 30 years to eventually recognize that we were in the ideological war in communism. More than 20 years, we still don't want to recognize that we are in an ideological war with Islamism. Now, now that's critical thing because that determines the whole context. If you realize that you are in ideological warfare, then you realize that you are on the constant disinformation campaign, then you realize that ideological warfare uses terrorism as a weapon against Jews, which are all part of ideology. Those, those are not separate events. It's been a long time coming. But tonight, because of what we did on this day, in this election, at this defining moment, change has come to America. By 2008, some leaders of the Democratic Party began painting America as a decaying, racist, capitalist realm. Unable even to provide medical care for the poor, it pledged to change all that by wealth redistribution. The leftist media jumped in, and overnight, change we can believe in was bursting forth everywhere. Change is the very essence of Marxism. It was a brilliant disinformation campaign, and Obama was the perfect instrument. Bright, charismatic, and a dynamic speaker with a seemingly blank slate. After 45 years of Cold War, millions of young Americans now believe that capitalism is their real enemy and should be replaced with socialism. Their new home, the Democratic Party, whose primary 2008 election theme was the promise to redistribute America's wealth. People always love a free lunch. No wonder the Democratic Party easily filled entire stadiums with people who demanded that the wealth of the United States be redistributed. 
some of those electoral gatherings looked like Ceausescu's revival meetings. It was a superb show of disinformation. I think it's fair to say that no president in American history has done more to subvert the Constitution. Obama said, I want to transform America. He is transforming America. And there is not enough rebellion, not enough. We need to wake up Americans, get to the young kids before they get brainwashed on campuses. In 2008, Obama's background, associations, and voting record clearly revealed him to be the hardest left candidate ever nominated for president of the United States. Despite the many revelations, the mainstream media remained silent. One of the overriding purposes of Glasnost is to hide the leader's past by giving him a new political identity. Thus it was that in America, the, the 2008 election campaign for the White House was, for me, a major case of deja vu. It felt as though I were watching a replay of one of Ceausescu's election campaigns. Just as Ceausescu loved to remind everyone that someone as great as he is born once every 500 years, so did Barack Obama. We are the ones we've been waiting for. After Obama's victory in 2008, the White House and the Democratic-controlled Congress began following in Marx's footsteps by redistributing the country's wealth and putting under government control parts of the healthcare, banking system, and automobile industries. Soon, the United States began being changed from a country belonging to we the people into one managed by a kind of a Marxist elite class with unchecked power. We have to pass the bill so that you can uh, find out what is in it. But the Democratic Party has built into it disinformation because they're leftists and progressives. You know, they said that Obamacare was uh, the cover of the uninsured. Now, now we find out that it's, it's going to un... <laughs> people will be kicked off their medical care because of Obamacare. So it didn't even do that. But that wasn't the goal. The goal was government control of your life. It's what they call single payer. That's communism. To have only the government supply you with health what could be more communistic than that? I came here when President Reagan was uh, president. This is not the same country. Absolutely not. When tens of thousands of Americans disagreed, a member of the U.S. congressional elite, Democratic Representative Steve Cohen, called them Nazis. It was a tried and true old Marxist tactic to demonize critics. It was a tactic that Obama would skillfully use on his next opponent with great success. If you've got a business, that, you didn't build that. Somebody else made that happen. This is the core of the Communist Manifesto. Its main task was to frame capitalism as a system based on theft. The demonizing of an ownership class that is stealing the labor of a lower class. And if you know the manifesto, you would have thought Marx himself wrote Obama's speech. Communism didn't die with the Cold War. It's alive and well. In fact, it's in the White House. Obama was brought up and spent his life in the same left that I left. Only the worst part of it, the Bill Ayers part. Uh, of course, today's communists are not stupid, and they adjust. But communism that uh, is alive and well and very, very strong because it, it, it represents that longing that people have, that life should be meaningful, that the world should be just and ordered. Change in the direction of greater fairness, was still the Democratic Party's theme for the 2012 election with the main target, American capitalism. In a 2008 Rasmussen poll, only 53% of Americans preferred capitalism to socialism, with another 27% unsure and 20% strongly opting for socialism. Saul Alinsky, who is the, the Karl Marx of, of, of the Obama left, his whole book is about lying. It's about the ends justify the means. Our ends are so noble because, because we're going to save the world. In war, any means is justified. And he says it in so many words. The half of the country is just getting something. But just philosophically, we forgot who we are. America used to stand for something. What do we stand for now? I, I fought against communism in the Soviet Union. I survived, I was exiled to the best and freest country in the world, you know, and, and if after that I start to see in this country the same thing which happened in the Soviet Union, yeah, I don't feel good and I try to speak out against it because 
I know what it means, and with my experience, I recognize any of such things immediately. The 2012 election ended an American tradition. Capitalism lost the election for the first time in the history of the United States. The Democratic Party's disinformation machinery was able to distort Romney's capitalist past to such a degree that he was always on the defensive, always portrayed as a greedy capitalist predator. It's a technique of pushing passion buttons in the human spirit to get people to feel angry, jealous, vindictive against people who succeed. But only certain kinds of people who succeed, people on the right who succeed, because people on the left who succeed never get demonized, right? I mean, nobody demonizes Barbara Streisand, right? Here's a woman who sang some songs. She's one of the richest people in America. What has she done for us recently? Nothing. And how come she deserves all that money? Well, Olympia is a very important example. I've interviewed, in my lifetime, I interviewed six, uh, Gaddafi six times. In 1993, off the record, he said, do you know Jim Woolsey, the head of the CIA? I said, yes, I've known him a long time, since long before, before he became director of the CIA. He said, well, I, you have to tell him something very important from me. I said, what's that, Colonel? He said, the Islamists are the biggest danger to you and to me and they are in Benghazi, and that's their headquarters. He wanted to work with the CIA against the Islamist extremists in, in Benghazi, and that was 1993. On September 11th, 2012, the American diplomatic mission at Benghazi in Libya was attacked. Four people were killed, including U.S. Ambassador J. Christopher Stevens. Over the next 14 days, the Obama administration conducted a blatant disinformation campaign. When you have the United Nations ambassador five days after an event, uh, going on the news service and spreading information that is clearly false. Uh, there could be no question that, that everybody knew that what she was saying, to include most of the American public, was false. That's a, that is a misinformation campaign, and she, she is using a disinformation uh, methodology to spread that. Benghazi is misinformation, disinformation, and no information all wrapped up. What troubles me about Benghazi is not that we were wrong in understanding the origin of the, uh, of the attack, at least for a little while, um, but uh, that the people who knew better dissembled about it. And I, I think it's obvious they did so for political reasons. We were close to an election. They did not want to acknowledge um, that uh, the, uh, the death of al-Qaeda may have been prematurely announced. It would have been embarrassing. And so they skated over the facts, even as the facts became, uh, became available. People demonstrating, protesting some video, do not show up in front of an American building carrying RPGs. Right, they're not crazy demonstrators who are all upset about some lunatic in California making a movie they don't like. The, the purpose was to ensure that the administration was reelected and that their chances of being reelected were not hurt because they had spread another disinformation that the administration has defeated Al Qaeda, that they're all but non existent. Only to find that not only has it not gone away, but it is very powerful and we're still their target. And I think we need to know the truth. I think for the American people not to have that information would be wrong. And so we're going to continue to push it. Whether or not we'll be successful will depend on you and if the American people call their congressmen. The ultimate expression of this disinformation by the Obama administration was the statement made before the UN General Assembly by the President of the United States fully two weeks after the September 11th attack, in which he again referred to the video, and then he made this statement. The future must not belong to those who slander the prophet of Islam. Now that's a sentence you could have heard Osama bin Laden, Mohammed Morsi, Ayman Zawahiri, any of these guys say as a justification for their jihadism against us. And it's not just disinformation on the part of the President of the United States. 
And I'm afraid the Obama administration is prepared to sacrifice our First Amendment rights. Disinformation has become the bubonic plague of our modern world. Water makes a hole in the stone not by force, but by constant dripping. That is how disinformation works, drop by drop by drop. It takes time. Virtually all of America's major institutions today are way to the left of the public. Now think about this. The American public for a long time have polled at 40% self-identify as conservative, 35% self-identify as moderate, and 20 or 21% as liberal. That 40% plus 35% conservative moderate is the center-right majority of America. And yet our institutions, our schools, and especially our colleges, which are absurdly to the left, Hollywood, the, the entertainment and news media, the foundations and philanthropies, even many of our churches are way over on the left. How did that happen? Antonio Gramsci was this uh, influential Italian communist who made up the phrase, the long march through the institutions. He said that we're going to have to take several generations to subvert, infiltrate, and change all of these institutions. We have a president right now whose watchword was transformation. We're going to fundamentally transform America. Today, a major source of disinformation is spread through conspiracy theories. Many governments in the Mideast take these theories as fact, much like the protocols of Zion are. The most incendiary still circulating revolve around 9-11 with such fabrications that the CIA or Mossad were behind the attacks and that no Jews died in the Twin Towers that day. People like conspiracy theories. It's kind of a substitute for God. That is, it puts order into the world. There's not random chaos and catastrophe. Everything is ordered because there's a conspiracy behind it. So people are prone. They feel comfortable with conspiracy theories. Over my 27 years in the Soviet bloc intelligence community, I was privy to many Cold War disinformation operations that eventually lost steam, but they were never entirely compromised because of that, that kernel of truth. So many still haunt the world like ghosts that never die. It seems that Americans have relaxed too much now, and they believe what they want to believe on the basis of whether or not it's convenient. Americans want to be amused. Now think about it, muse is to think. Amuse is without thinking. So they'd rather sit in front of the TV and watch a reality show and then take a 30-second sound bite, which could be from the media, it could be a news flash, or it could be a political ad. That political ad, for example, might say, well, the Republicans are for the wealthy and the Democrats are for the common man. And they form their opinion on that, on that 30-second sound bite, and then go back to being amused because they make no effort to try and discern the truth. They make no effort to go beyond what is in their comfort zone. So they will believe the lies of the media, and the media does. The media is part of the disinformation campaign. Uh, you know, one of the really interesting things, talking about disinformation, is the extent to which we have now permitted uh, not simply programming that would have been, frankly, unimaginable, I think, during the Cold War, in terms of its sympathy for the Russians and uh, its willingness to portray the United States in a very unflattering light. But we have Russia today, we have Chinese Xinhua, we have Al Jazeera and other instruments of enemy propaganda, or certainly the, the, the information warfare apparatuses of countries that are unfriendly to the United States and I think wish us ill now having access to millions of Americans' homes. And um, that's a vehicle for disinformation and for that matter, as I say, political warfare on an epic scale. The lies have been allowed to become history, to become truth. But what is truth? What is history? Without understanding the outrageous and uniquely Soviet tactic of disinformation, our worldview can become distorted. There is no defensive strategy in ideological war. There is no defense. You have always been offensive, you have attack. 
You believe in your own ideas, right? Go ahead, be offensive, attack, promote those ideas, bring it to them. Not, not, never be apologetic. Ne never try to excuse and explain why you have those things. That's, that's absolutely creepy because just you start to do it. People start to have doubts whether you are really right or whether you really yourself believe in those own ideas. Even today, progressives are subtly repackaging the communists' ideas and legacies and passing them on in the curricula of our schools, in the news media, in Hollywood films, on the internet and on TV. Over the past several decades, American universities have grown into a hotbed of disinformation. I'm very concerned about America. I feel this is not the same America that I discovered when I arrived here in 1980. Um, I think the most dangerous source of evil brainwashing and propaganda is coming from Ivy League schools, top-notch schools. Um, the only place on earth where people still believe in Marxism and Leninism and communism. Only the only bulwark against uh, disinformation is knowledge. And that's why the educational system is so important. And that's why the current American crisis really is based on the failure of our educational system and the takeover of the educational system by a single ideology. What I cannot stand and what really terrifies me about the country nowadays is that it's so monolithic. And, uh, you know, people start saying, well, look at Obama. Where did Obama get all these crazy ideas from? I keep saying to them, look, Obama is, uh, you can find a thousand Obamas in, in chat rooms online or in dormitories anywhere in our top universities. Just go in, guys sitting around drinking beer and talking. They'll talk just like him because he believes what they believe. They think the same way he thinks. All these slogans based on nothing. Promoting Marxist ideas and approaches with no mention of the bloody legacy of these doctrines is the rule rather than the exception. College campuses are teeming with anti-America, anti-Jew, and anti-white rhetoric. A professor's job is not to tell students what to think. It is to help them to think critically and for themselves. Yet thousands of professors go to work every day with the intention of indoctrinating their students in their political prejudices. These supposed teachers have even included unrepentant terrorists Bill Ayers, Kathy Bodan and Bernadine Dorn of the Weather Underground. Resistance by every means necessary is happening and will continue to happen within the United States as well as around the world. And I remain committed to the struggle ahead. The secular universities in America, they are radically leftist, not liberal. Liberal is, my dad was a liberal, okay. We're talking radical leftist, communist, socialist, Marxist, statist, they are, they are learning things in colleges today that have nothing to do with the foundational principles of America and what made America and made those universities even possible. There's a professor now, I forgot in what school in the United States, who said that's absolutely false that Stalin and the Stalinist regime, not Stalin personally, killed millions of people. What do you do with such a person? And who teaches? And who basically, this is basically a discourse of implicit hatred by denying, the, by basically by killing these people the second time. This is historical pornography. Following the Boston Marathon bombing, Princeton University professor Richard Falk stated that the US should not be surprised. After all, it supports Israel. Falk quoted a line from poet W.H. Auden. Those to whom evil is done do evil in return. He went on to suggest that there will be more such attacks, especially if there is no disposition to rethink U.S. relations to others in the world, starting with the Middle East. Such teachers are now no longer confined to university campuses and college courses. In March of 2013, parents in Tennessee discovered their high school students were being taught disinformation from a human geography textbook. Among the many leftist statements and historical inaccuracies was a highly anti-Semitic question dealing with terrorism. The textbook states, distinguishing terrorism from other acts of political violence can be difficult. For example, if a Palestinian suicide bomber kills several dozen Israeli teenagers in a Jerusalem restaurant, is that terrorism or wartime retaliation against Israeli government policies and army actions? 
In the recent case of the Boston Marathon Massacre, carried out by two Caucasian Muslim brothers, one an American citizen, the question is asked, what could be the motivation? Looking at the liberal elite intellectual thought that infects the Boston community and schools might be a good place to start. The younger brother of the pair graduated from the celebrated Boston High School, Cambridge Ringe and Latin School, where he was daily taught anti-American disinformation. His history teacher, Larry Aronson, is a disciple of the raving, America-hating, revisionist historian Howard Zinn. He is taught from the Marxist anti-American history book by Zinn, A People's History of the United States, since 1981. If you don't know Zinn's contempt for America, here's a sample of his work. Around 1776, certain important people in the English colonies made a discovery that would prove enormously useful for the next 200 years. They found that by creating a nation, a legal entity called the United States, they could take over land, profits, and political power from the favorites of the British Empire. Zinn was a liberal elite darling who claimed his eyes were open to the racist, imperialist horror that is America by writer I.F. Stone. Stone was a prominent writer in his day, who later was confirmed to be a paid KGB agent when the Iron Curtain fell and certain Soviet documents became public. It is more than coincidental that his articles expressed the position of the Soviet Union on so many issues. Today, the mainstream press is increasingly revealed to be little more than a government propaganda ministry. The big media in today's America are becoming barely more respected and believable than were their Soviet counterparts a generation ago. Some trace it to the 60s Cultural Revolution, when the radical left literally spilled out into America's streets, while university campuses gave rise to a host of radical new liberation movements. Undeniably, the misnamed mainstream media have been the primary force behind many leftist agendas for at least a generation. The mainstream media is largely a, a provider of disinformation. The news media in America today, I think, can fairly be described as a full-time disinformation machine. You gotta remember there are two parts to disinformation. One is the message, it's a lie. It's meant to advance a certain agenda, okay? The other part of that disinformation machinery is that the, the delivery vehicle for the message has to be credible, at least in the minds of the people receiving the message. The news media have long been credible to the public mind. Even people that say, yeah, they're kind of liberal. Still, people think that if something really bad is happening, the media will tell them about it. And that, unfortunately, has not been the case. There is hope. Not the Obama kind, but the real kind. A widespread media revolution is in progress as millions are gravitating to the new media. Today, you have a very robust talk radio world, you have the internet. I work for WND, which is a big online news organization. Basically, it is a new world where people can go to a news source where they feel comfortable that the basic worldview of the people behind that news source is compatible with theirs. In the 20th century, film and cinema have become the most powerful tools of information and disinformation. Goebbels in Nazi Germany and Stalin in Russia used the power of film to spread propaganda within their countries and worldwide. Few filmmakers today come under the hand of government control. Unfortunately, though, many filmmakers have bought into the lie of Marxism and socialism and delved deeply into the art of disinformation. Hollywood is a fascinating case of disinformation because it's disinformation being promulgated by the uninformed. It's people whose minds have already been brainwashed, essentially, then spewing out what they were told by the media to spew out. But the power of Hollywood, because it has a lot of talented people to promulgate this information, advertently and inadvertently, is stupendous. In fact, it's probably more powerful than the liberal politicians, because that disinformation is going out to young people who are minds are not critical and who have already and the ground has been prepared in the schools and the schools are actually taking a liberal pablo movie and showing it to the schools and the kids think it's real and probably the most famous and best at the craft of deceptive cinema is oliver stone over the last two decades 
he has produced a string of films that repeatedly demonstrate his Marxist worldview and spew anti-American disinformation. He could have easily worked for the KGB back in the day. In his untold history of the United States, America is portrayed as an evil force in the events of the last 75 years. The pseudo-documentary film series evokes overt sympathy for the Germans and the Japanese during World War II, as well as for Stalin himself. It's just total nonsense, and it portrays, again, Comrade Stalin as this poor, misunderstood person. And if we'd only been nicer to Comrade Stalin, things would have worked out so much better. I mean, the Cold War is our fault, according to that. What he's done for Showtime is much more dangerous, because that presents it as a documentary of World War II and says that uh, the U.S. was unfair to Stalin at Yalta and things like that. And first, first of all, the average viewer has never heard of Yalta. They vaguely heard of Stalin as kind of a Russian bad guy. They don't know anything about any of this stuff. So they, they're, they've, effectively, they've been propagandized. They've been recipients of disinformation. I was sitting down with a, a woman who's a, a prominent figure in the Hispanic American community, and she was telling me that she was learning all kinds of things about this country that she hadn't known as a result of Oliver Stone and his research. Historian Ronald Radish calls the untold history Cold War revisionism and sees similarities to communist author Karl Marjani's book, We Can Be Friends, The Origins of the Cold War. Over and over, Stone uses the same quotations, the same arrangements of material, and the same arguments as Marjani, a Soviet agent in 1952. Rather than being shouted down as many did at the release of Stone's JFK, the untold history has been widely embraced by the left-wing academic establishment and by the progressive culture in general. There have been no outcries over the libels committed on the memories of Truman, Kennedy, or America. This clearly demonstrates how the Soviet disinformation machine has won the culture war in the U.S. Robert Redford is another filmmaker known for his leftist-leaning anti-America disinformation. His recent movie, The Company You Keep, is thinly disguised as an ode to the 60s as the model of activism and terrorism for every future generation to emulate. The 1960s have become to the left what 1776 once was to the old America. Each protest, down to Occupy Wall Street, is looked upon as a rebirth of the spirit of the 60s. The movie paints its main characters, former weather underground type radicals, in a flattering light, even though they confuse murder with idealism and youthful anger with principles. All the people I knew when I was young wanted America to lose the Cold War. And they did it for what some people call idealistic reasons, uh, but uh, I don't. I don't see it that way. I, that, that tends to excuse what they did. Um, they were blinded because they believed uh, in a future in which uh, socialism, communism, uh, which there would be social justice. That's the term today for delusional people on the left. The American left has a long history of treating radical killers like heroes. We see this today as communist murderers such as Stalin, Mao, and Che are lifted to mythical status. Time Magazine writes, the company you keep is streaked with melancholy, a disappointment that the second American revolution never came. Of course, the melancholy mourning is not for those murdered, but that the violence fizzled out without accomplishing anything. Thus, the film is another disinformation vehicle, a revisionist history of the 60s in which change might have happened if only the left had never compromised. The real history is that the radicals of the weather underground were not passionate and committed intellectuals, but liars and murderers. In the 1960s, Larry Grothwall was an FBI infiltrator posing as a radical communist. When he testified before a federal grand jury in the U.S. Senate, he exposed the real weather underground, their bomb-making exploits, their murderous bank robbery, and the unrepentant nature of key underground figures Bill Ayers and Bernadine Dorn. In Grothwall's true account of the events and the characters involved, he describes military training weathermen received in Cuba with Russian weapons and details of how sympathetic professors helped set up weathermen bases across American campuses. The weathermen also targeted high schools, which they saw as prisons. It is not surprising that the most prominent terrorist, Bill Ayers, now has a career in education. 
By training teachers to indoctrinate American children, he exploits the country from within more efficiently than his homemade bombs ever could. At one minute before one o'clock this morning, the switchboard at the Capitol received a phone call. A man's voice said a bomb would go off in the building in half an hour. At 1.30 in the morning, it did. In a small, unmarked restroom on the ground floor of the Senate side, next to a barber shop and near several small offices, including one committee hearing room, for a report on the first serious damage to the nation's foremost structure since the British burned it in 1814. Credit for the Capitol bombing was claimed in a letter received by the Associated Press today, signed by the Weather Underground. Ho Chi Minh's birthday was also marked in Washington. A bomb exploded early this morning in the Pentagon, and left-wing terrorists telephoned newspapers to say they were responsible. People calling themselves members of the Weather Underground last night planted bombs in federal office buildings in Washington and Oakland, California. That other bomb threat was a dramatic one at a military induction center in Oakland, California today. With the sitting U.S. president effectively starting his political career in Bill Ayer's living room, the story of the Weather Underground and its radical ideology isn't going away. People poo-pooing. Oh, yeah, yeah, he had friends who were terrorists and whatever, you know. I didn't have any friends who were terrorists. I worked undercover against terrorists. I met with terrorists. In 1999, French scholar Stéphane Coutois' Black Book of Communism charged Marxism-Leninism with being responsible for the deaths of 150 million human beings since the Russian Revolution of 1917. When KGB archives became public in the post-Cold War era, those calculations were shown to be more than credible. Many have begun to face the sobering reality that the human devastation perpetrated by communism surpasses even Nazism's shameful record. The Soviet Union did kill more people than, than, than Hitler. I mean, some, uh, some uh, sources suggest there was up to 60 million people. And just imagine one country killing 60 million, million people in the Stalin era alone. Throughout the world, Communism turned mass crime into a full-blown system of government, and disinformation played a significant role in these crimes of the century. Hitler resorted to disinformation to portray the Jews as an inferior and loathsome race so as to rationalize his Holocaust. Disinformation was the tool used by Lenin and Stalin to dispossess a third of the world and transform it into a string of gulags. Disinformation has also set off the international terrorism that threatens us today. Disinformation has caused worldwide damage to the reputation of the United States. And now it's putting down roots here. To fight this invisible weapon, we must first recognize it for what it is and decode its hidden mission. Since it is usually clothed in innocuous civilian dress, as were the terrorists who killed 3,000 Americans on September 11th. My guess is that the Ronald Reagan of 1976 would be very clear about the mortal peril that is facing our country. And he would set about, in his inimitable way, laying out an optimistic but very hard-headed strategy for trying to turn things around, uh, for getting our government back onto a track that respects and upholds and defends our Constitution. Uh, I think he would also be very clear about the sort of threat that he recognized in his time from totalitarians, especially their ability to use not only violence and the threat of violence, but also disinformation as a means of subverting us and destroying us from within. Another few years, we will not be a superpower in any way. Not economically, not militarily, not intellectually, not in any way, unless the pendulum swings. But I am an optimist. I, I love this country. I, uh, I've been all over the world. I do believe the American spirit. I do believe that Americans, you can push them up to a point, but sooner or later they will say, stop it. Enough. Because when you have on one hand intensive, well-organized propaganda, you know, who repeats and repeats the same thing. And you are sitting passively instead of developing your own propaganda. And I say propaganda can be a very good word is the things which you try to explain are good things. So propaganda of freedom and democracy is good. 
Let's put it this way, because it's pretty simple. The late Andrew Breitbart, who was a good friend of mine, said one thing, I, politics is downstream of culture. And I, he was 100% correct. By the time you get to the age of voting, your mind has already been filled up with right and wrong and this and that, so many other things that you're not, you're not seeing straight. And especially given that the educational system has been permeated by the left as well. So there's nothing more important than seizing the culture. And you're not going to do it in a day because it's really hard. But you've got to do it step by step. And if you don't, it's over. I think the circumstances in America are going to force us out of our comfort zone. And then we're going to start looking for truth. And we'll find it in alternate media, we'll find it in the church, and we'll find it among our fellow Americans. With all our being, we must reject Marxism, science, and disinformation that has been used so negatively to transform our world. Let us return to the American traditions of patriotism, honesty, and fairness. The United States of America is the greatest country on earth. We must preserve it that way for future generations. That is why I speak out. Winston Churchill said the destiny of man is not measured by material computations. When great forces are on the move in the world, we learn we're spirits, not animals. And he said there's something going on in time and space and beyond time and space, which, whether we like it or not, spells duty. You and I have a rendezvous with destiny. We'll preserve for our children this, the last best hope of man on earth, or we'll sentence them to take the last step into a thousand years of darkness. It has been many years since I escaped from that evil society known as the Soviet Empire and came to the United States, the land of my youthful dreams. Even today, it is still difficult for me to, to find adequate words to express my gratitude to the U.S. government for for granting me political asylum. July 28th, 1989 was the most important benchmark in my new life. On that day, I became an American citizen. I paid with two death sentences and multiple attempts to kill me for the privilege of becoming a citizen of this unique land of freedom. And I believe it is my duty to help it avoid the Marxist curse. In a letter from the CIA, he was credited as the only person in the Western world who had single-handedly demolished an entire enemy espionage service. You have made an important and unique contribution to the United States, of which you can justly be proud. Therefore, it gives me great pleasure on this momentous and solemn occasion to wish you happiness and fulfillment in this country as a U.S. citizen. On July 7th, 1999, Romania's Supreme Court canceled Pacepa's death sentences, yet Romania's government refused to comply, and it still treats him like a traitor. Romania is a marvelous country, which once had the misfortune of falling under the spell of Marxism and disinformation. I love my native country. I treasure my first 50 years of life there, my, my relatives, my good friends, and, and the graves of my parents. I started my life over at the age of 50 in order to help Romania's courageous people rid themselves of one of the most disgusting tyrants history has ever known. I felt a strong obligation to do so. With all my heart, I wanted to see Romania re-enter the democratic world to which it once belonged. Even though the serialization of Red Horizons by Radio Free Europe in 1989 played an incontestable role in overthrowing Ceausescu, a new Romanian generation has started believing the egomaniacal dictator was actually a national hero. Now, Lieutenant General Pacepa has become the victim of disinformation and is portrayed as a man who betrayed his boss at the direction of the KGB and the CIA. Once again, the black art of framing comes to life. But from those that know him and speak of him, he is greatly admired for who he is, for what he has done with his life, for what he has done for his native Romania, and for what he has done for the United States. Yon Mihai Pacepa broke with the system for moral reasons and courageously exposed its terrorist underpinnings. He has proven to be a formidable witness and a respected analyst of the communist intrigues, schemes, and manipulations that still threaten our world. Today, we need more Pachepas to step forward, to bring light into the darkness.